and uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining um, this NET talk today. Um, as Rafa mentioned, my name is Jarrell Torres, as I work at uh, CIRA, uh, the Cooperative Institute for Research in the Atmosphere, and I'll be focusing and highlighting uh, the low Earth orbit NOAA satellite data, focusing on the Joint Polar Satellite System and how our data benefits you. So let's get started. So first of all, I want to highlight. Yes, go ahead. Of the way so that it doesn't block your presentation. Okay, sorry about that. That's perfect. And, um, let's see here. Way. Let's see if that works. Is that better? Much better. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, as um, I mentioned, the first question is, what is JPSS? And of course, um, it's the Joint Polar Satellite System, which is essentially the backbone of global satellite-based observations and products that integrate into the U.S. Uh, forecasting models. Now, JP the JPSS program consists of five satellites. Two that are in orbit currently, you have the SUMI National Polar Orbiting Partnership, or SNPP, that launched back in October of 2011, and that currently orbits the globe, producing satellite data sets for our users. In addition to that, we also had the NOAA 20 satellites, formerly known as JPSS-1, that launched back in November of 2017, that also does the same thing, providing uh, data sets for our users. Now we look forward to three more satellites that are part of this program, JPSS-2, JPSS-3, and JPSS-4, that will be launching uh, throughout the next decade, where right now our current focus is on increasing the data availability um, as we look forward to the JPSS-2 launch, as of right now tentatively scheduled for September of 2022. And also know that from JPSS, we, uh, JPSS provides a continuous on-orbit presence going back to 2011 with SMPP, then all the way through uh, 2038 with JPSS-4. Now, the next question that, um, that comes along is, so what are these polar orbiting satellites that I speak of? These satellites operate in low Earth orbits, and they observe the Earth from pole to pole completely uh, more than two times a day. Now the Earth's rotation allows for the satellite to see a different view of the Earth's surface and atmosphere with each orbit. Now with polar orbiters, they're quite unique where their instruments uh, gather critical information uh, with respect to atmospheric temperature and water vapor data sets uh, that then get assimilated into the numerical weather forecast models and that assist in um, uh, the forecasting. And in addition to that, for observing our current weather, especially over a fixed view of the Western Hemisphere, over North America or, or um, the U.S. here, uh, we have imagery that, current, uh, that comes from the polar orbiting satellites along with the geostationary data sets as well. Uh, we have SMPP, we have NOAA 20, and then from the geo side over the U.S., we also have GO 16 and GO 17. And now these uh, satellites provide a world-class observations of weather that help with our, predict, our prediction capabilities at the National Weather Service that you may have heard of or NWS and that can assist in saving lives and protecting local economies. Now this animation to the right here in the top is showing um, the uh, lower 48 uh, of the United States and highlighting the polar orbiting satellite imagery of a synoptically scaled low pressure system that is um, covering the, the eastern U.S. Um, and where you have satellite overpasses uh, from SNPP and NOAA 20. Now around the same time frame, you also have uh, the geostationary perspective here. The whole point of the comparison of these two uh, animations is how we as JPSS can also work with GOES and helping users understand how, uh, understanding the pros and cons of each satellite and how they can work together for the NOAA mission. And of course, with the geostationary data sets, they have the higher temporal resolution. And now with the polar orbiting data sets, in regards to the imagery, the data is not as timely. However, it provides an even higher spatial resolution um, of, of the imagery compared to the GOES. So point being, you can utilize both data sets 
in, um, with respect to the particular um, no omission of interest. Some additional thoughts with JPSS, uh, it provides, first of all, um, critical data for numerical weather prediction in the forecast models, helping enable accurate three to seven day forecasts. Also, uh, JPSS also helps with the um, providing imagery in data sparse regions, especially over the oceans, over the Arctic, the Antarctic, and near the poles, and providing additional imagery and coverage over those respective areas. And then if you look in the furthest right, image here. Um, not only does JPSS provide global coverage, but it also has unique nighttime visible applications uh, from the day-night band you may have heard of, which if you're not familiar with the day-night band, it is um, one of the 22, it's a part of the 22 spectral bands on the VIRS instruments, uh, which is on board both SMPP and NOAA 20. And with this particular day-night band, it utilizes a sun-moon reflectance model to illuminate your atmospheric features during the nighttime and also senses emitted light sources during the nighttime. So what you're seeing in this static image of, over the state of Alaska, you're seeing emitted lights from an aurora that is passing through the state. And then also, if you look closely or by my cursor, you'll see some uh, clusters of emitted city lights and or town lights uh, from the towns and cities uh, within Alaska as well. Now, also, we want to express the value of JPSS data. You know, although, um, you know, the value of the JPSS data could be hard to quantify in dollar amounts, um, there's no question that the economic benefits of weather forecasts uh, made possible by polar orbiting satellites um, are substantial and far-reaching. Um, from a NOAA uh, 2011 report, um, estimated that the American public gains approximately $31 billion in benefits from weather forecasts each year. Now compare that to the annual cost of generating those forecasts from, the, from either the public or private sectors, and that cost is approximately around $5 billion. So you see the, the uh, cost-benefit analysis there. And then also, wanted to highlight, I want, wanted to highlight the, um, just the, the magnitude of the uh, billion dollar weather and climate disasters that occur every year, but this is just an example of this current year, 2021, from the beginning of January through October 8th of this year, where there has been um, at least 18, or has been 18 weather climate disaster events with losses exceeding um, $1 billion and um, that have affected the U.S. And these climate disasters range from heat waves to droughts to wildfires in the west, uh, of course with severe weather or cold spells, and then transitioning eastward to like severe weather um, effects, um, hailstorms, tor uh, tornadoes, uh, also hurricanes with the, um, the flooding issues, and then also power outages that may occur from severe weather or from tropical weather uh, systems, and then just the, the range of severe weather that has occurred throughout uh, the spring and summertime of this past year. But uh, the point here is also highlighting, you know, with the, uh, with the, with the satellite data sets from polar marine satellites to help improve the forecast model to help uh, mitigate these impacts. And in addition to this, um, there's also not only SMPP and NOAA 20, along with uh, JPSS 2, 3, and 4, uh, there's also, uh, we have also our international satellites from our international partners uh, that also assist in the global forecasting model. So in addition to SMPP and NOAA 20, of course, we look forward to JPSS2 that will provide additional imagery and data sets um, and also help improve with the model. But we also have our military satellites and the DMSP satellites. We also have our satellites from uh, the Europeans and the, um, uh, the METSAT satellites, uh, which are METOP A, B, and C. And we also have uh, the Coriolis satellites along with I believe uh, the, the GCOM satellite as well, which uh, comes from uh, the Japanese Space Agency as well. But point being, all these uh, uh, different satellites uh, make up 85% uh, make up 85 of the data in global weather models, and uh, that come, that 85 percent of that data comes from polar orbiting satellites. So you see the significant value um, of polar orbiting uh, data sets. And then also, how JPSS improves that forecast accuracy as well, uh, providing critical data to uh, numerical forecast models, um, producing three to 
seven-day uh, mid-range forecasts, along with providing, su providing support for zero to three-day operational forecasting in polar regions, especially where data, uh, data is sparse. And now I'll transition to a lot of the JPSS applications. Um, and then I'll get more into the image interpretation as well. So first thing here is highlighting how polar orbiting satellites can uh, observe hurricanes. Here's just a few examples from Hurricane Dorian that occurred back in 2019. An example from NOAA 20 and the VIRS instrument, the, uh, one of the infrared uh, imagery bands there observing the cloud structure of Hurricane Dorian and the very cold brightness temperatures um, of that hurricane there. And also seeing the very high spatial resolution detail of the eye of that hurricane. Now, in addition to that, on the right here is, um, is the VIRS flood products. Now, the VIRS instrument is, is, from the, uh, is an instrument on board SMPP and NOAA 20. And with this VIRS instrument, uh, you have a VIRS flood products that are at high spatial resolution. And um, this example highlights the flood and inundation that occurred after Hurricane Dorian passed through the Bahamas. Now, uh, to help, in, help with the image interpretation, the blue indicate open water or the ocean, brown indicates land, and then the uh, flood water fraction percentage from zero to 100% ranges from greens to yellows to oranges to reds, where the reds indicate the most inundated areas. So you're seeing the most inundated areas over the Bahama Island chains out there caused by Hurricane Dorian. And then quickly as well, I wanted to highlight just the impact of uh, the satellite data sets within the forecast. Here's just an example of, um, of a forecasting simulation of Hurricane Irma back in 2017. And this, uh, the, the top animation compared to the lower animation is essentially the top animation highlights the forecast with the satellite data sets ingested where you can um, uh, observe and visualize the hurricane location, but then also get an idea of the forecast track. Um, in comparison to the bottom, which is the same forecast, except without the satellite data sets, you can see that it's really challenging to determine the location and then also the forecast track without the uh, uh, satellites. So just also, this also highlights just how impactful the satellite data sets are uh, to the global, for, uh, for, uh, global uh, model forecasts. And then getting a little bit more into those JPSS um, applications, the next one here is highlighting um, how users can utilize JPSS data in regards to power outages. So we're going to um, revert back to the nighttime visible, uh, nighttime visible applications in the day-night band. And as I mentioned, with the day-night band, it helps illuminate atmospheric features during the nighttime and also senses emitted light sources during the, during the night. Um, uh, with specifically, in this particular case, we're looking at emitted light from cities and or towns. Now, on the left here is a reference image giving you just a general idea on any given night how the emitted lights look like on the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico. And you see the emitted lights along the U.S. territory there, and then just to the east of um, there as well of the neighboring islands and how the emitted lights look like on any day of a night, assuming that there's no cloud obscuration in the way. Now, in comparison to that, and to uh, the, the right image here is a, about a day or two after Hurricane Maria passed through, where you can see and infer uh, in a qualitative manner the, uh, the significant reduction in the emitted lights, so you can infer in certain areas, such as the northeastern portions and southeastern portions of Puerto Rico, and then also um, the islands uh, just to the east, where there's not as many emitted lights uh, being seen. And you can also see some parts in like central uh, Puerto Rico as well, where it's a, a, um, there's, there's not as many emitted lights. So you can infer in these particular areas that they're experiencing some power outages to a degree. In addition to this, uh, some other JPSS applications are in predicting flood and drought risk. I did mention the Veers flood product earlier. Here's an example here of the CMORPH 2 precipitation rate product in millimeters per hour. And what you're seeing is an animation of Hurricane Ida 
uh, that was in the Gulf of Mexico, made landfall in Louisiana, and then uh, moved inland. And I'll toggle back and forth real quick again so you can see that animation again. But the point is, with the Seamorph 2, you not only have the JPSS data, but you also have um, data from other uh, satellites, international satellites, that are, that are blended into that product to help users gain knowledge of the rain rates, especially where areas where there, there is no radar or, or there's uh, no data at all, data sparse. And uh, these satellites can help in um, helping users observe, um, in this case, rainfall rates um, over offshore and then inland as well. And then, of course, at the bottom here, we also have our vegetation health products, or VHI, for example, here that can assist and help the USDA, for example, in expressing how drought and crop conditions um, will affect crop yield and also um, in, infer the risk of uh, food scarcity, uh, whether it be in the U.S. or around the world. Now I'll transition to uh, more of the fire weather applications. Um, here's an example of smoke forecasting. What we have is the HERS smoke model, which is at three kilometer spatial resolution. And it's also been a fan favorite of National Weather Service uh, weather forecast offices or WFOs um, over the last few years. And especially uh, where the WFOs message uh, and utilize this product and message this product um, uh, to the public in helping users and the general public uh, be aware of uh, air quality forecasts. And this particular her smoke model utilizes fire radiative power observations and our measurements from VIRS and then also the motors instruments um, as well uh, to help simulate uh, that uh, smoke forecast. And the smoke forecasts are produced every hour for the CONUS. And as I mentioned, they help create those air quality forecasts here. And what you're seeing to the right here is just an image of NWS Albuquerque. Um, and how they're messaging the Hearst smoke model and messaging to uh, the general public of what areas within uh, the state of New Mexico here by my cursor are going to be significant are going to be significantly impacted by higher smoke concentrations, specifically in the northeastern portions of New Mexico, where then uh, conversely on the western side and southwestern side there are less impacts. And then here's just another example, a pretty uh, pretty good example back in July of this year, utilizing the same Hearst Smoke product. And on the left, I'll describe, uh, this is the Hearst Smoke model utilizing the near surface smoke uh, product in micrograms per meter cubed. Now this sur near surface smoke product essentially uh, simulates smoke concentrations just above ground level, approximately eight meters above the ground, and then simulates it uh, downwind. And what you're seen here is the uh, 12Z uh, model initialization and then forecast valid for 18Z. And at 18Z, the forecast is highlighting that there's going to be a significant amount of smoke concentrations in the northern high plains and particularly in Minnesota. And then also in areas of northern Washington state and southern British Columbia by my cursor and then also in parts of Montana. Now I compare this her smoke model forecast for 18Z, since it's valid for 18Z, and compare it to what actually happened. And this is actually the GOES geocolor, so another example of highlighting JPSS and GOES working together. And, regard, and what you're seeing with the GOES geocolor at the same timestamp is you're seeing the significant smoke concentrations in uh, the state of Minnesota and also in eastern South Dakota and Wisconsin uh, being observed there. And what was interesting about this case scenario was that there weren't any fires in Minnesota at this particular time. There were actually fires just to the north near Winnipeg in Canada, which the fires were um, uh, blowing, the fires in southern Canada were blowing smoke down south into Minnesota and really high smoke concentrations. And then in addition to that, there was also uh, the smoke concentrations being observed as well in Washington, uh, northern Washington and southern British Columbia as well, which the Hearst smoke um, forecasted. And now with the Montana, it was a little bit more challenging because you had some um, cloud obscuration in the way to try to observe if there was any smoke there. But uh, here's just also some physical validation, uh, just a, a webcam uh, produced from um, the Minnesota NWS highlighting the heavy smoke that reached the St. Cloud, uh, Cloud Airport, um, at which the visibility was reduced to approximately three quarters of a mile. 
Now I'll highlight some more uh, uh, JPSS applications for users. First one here is a product that was derived from uh, my institute at CIRA. It is the Advected Layered Precipital Water Product, or ALPW, which observes your precipital water values excuse me, um, in four uh, different layers, or atmospheric uh, thickness layers. You have your surface to 850 uh, millibar layer. You have your 850 millibar to 700 millibar layer thickness level, your 700 to 500, and then your 500 to 300. And what you're observing here with this ALPW product is a really strong low pressure system that passed, um, or that was very strong and was about to uh, make landfall in the Pacific Northwest. This actually occurred within the last two weeks. And this low pressure was so strong that it uh, had a tailing atmospheric river uh, associated with it where you had really high concentrations of precipital water values, not only in the low levels uh, described by the surface to 850, 850 to 700, but then also at least all the way up to 700 to 500 at least, which then as this low pressure system made landfall, it produced significant precipitation, not only for the Pacific Northwest, uh, if you look by my cursor, but then um, uh, very importantly as well, North Central California. And also, I, I need to remind you that with the ALPW, um, this product is derived from at least six or seven polar orbiting satellite data sets, along with GFS to model winds to infect the moisture within that product. Now, in comparison, there's also another product, the NOAA Nezis Blended Total Precipital Water Product, also comprised of polar orbiting satellite data, along with some geostationary data as well, I think with GPS data as well. But it also observed that long fetch of atmospheric moisture. Um, which led to that significant amount of precipitation. And I also want to thank uh, Sheldon Cusselson there, one of my colleagues at CIRA, that um, uh, uh, produced that imagery for me. In addition to that, there's some uh, other nighttime visible applications I want to highlight to users as well. Um, going back to the nighttime visible applications, uh, you can also observe here on the left is an animation of observing lake ice motion during the nighttime. And this is over Lake Erie, you know, and this will be helpful for any kind of uh, maritime vessels or users that need to traverse the Lake Erie to get from one point to another and how um, uh, the, the different spatial extent of ice and or ice motion will affect their travel. Uh, then also on the right with the nighttime visible imagery applications, you, all, you can also observe tropical cyclones. This is actually Hurricane Ida as it was approaching the Gulf Coast. And what you can see is not only the, um, the spatial extent of Hurricane Ida there, if you look closely, you can look at, you can see the eye of the hurricane there. And actually, if you look to the southern periphery of Hurricane Ida, you can also see this elongated white streak. Now, this elongated white streak is indicative of lightning that's being observed within the storm. And that elongated white streak is produced due to the time discontinuity between the satellite overpass, in this case the Veers overpass, uh, compared to the, uh, the duration of a lightning strike, which is on the order of milliseconds. Um, and that time discontinuity will produce that elongated white streak there. And now about 12 hours later, uh, comparing that previous Hurricane Ida image from the day-night band, you can also see about 12 hours later, the uh, uh, Veers, uh, Veers overpass of Hurricane Ida making landfall, uh, traversing over um, the state of Louisiana here. And this is a particular RGB, or day cloud phase distinction RGB, and just a quick way uh, to interpret the, uh, what you're seeing here, in addition to just the magnitude of the, the hurricane here, is um, liquid water clouds are in blue. Glaciated clouds, or increased vertical depth of those clouds, are in green. Uh, the yellow clouds are uh, thick ice clouds. And then the red in there are high, thin ice clouds. And then what you can also see in the center, in the, in the eye there, are the, uh, <laughs> are the liquid water clouds in the, in the eye there, which is pretty interesting. And then uh, just a, a few more fire weather examples. Um, and we'll go from uh, the top imagery and animations first. The first thing I wanted to highlight is the Boot Lake Fire, which there's different points of view uh, with the top animations here. And the top left is just another example of how you can utilize both JPSS and GOES datasets 
in this particular case in observing and monitoring fires, what you're seeing here is the, uh, the static image of the VIRS active fire product, which uh, the pixels are color coded and it goes from yellows to oranges to reds to dark reds. Now the, the more red or dark red it is, the more intense the fire is. And what you're seeing is the, the most intense portions of the fire are, are at this particular timestamp are at the northern periphery of that fire. And that kind of corresponds um, to the, uh, the GO-17 visible uh, animation that you're seeing just over that or overlaid onto it where you're seeing some pyrocumulus being produced near the northern periphery of that fire. So just once again, another example where you could utilize GOES and JPSS together, uh, in this case for the fire mission. In addition to that, we're talking about the same fire uh, if you look at the top center animation and then the top right animation. These are our VIRS fire RGBs. The top center one highlights the VIRS Dayland Cloud Fire RGB, where you're observing the rapid fire aerial extent um, of the fire over the course of a week. And this particular RGB is sensitive to vegetation health, so say burn scars, but then also fire smoke, which you're seeing in the bluish gray there, as you see the smoke um, encompassing the fire and then also infecting to the northeast there. In addition to that, if you look at the top right animation, the same time frame over the course of a week, highlighting that rapid fire extents with the VIRS fire temperature RGB that you're using here, this particular RGB users can utilize in a qualitative manner to infer your fire intensity. Now, the, the pixels change from red to orange to yellow to white, where red pixels indicate your cooler fires and your yellow and white pixels indicate your most intense fires. So just by looking at this animation, you can see that the most intense portions of the fires are on the northern and eastern flanks of the fire. Now, in the bottom left, I'll uh, come back to the Veer's Dayland Cloud Fire RGB. And as I mentioned before, with this RGB, it is sensitive to vegetation health. So in this case, we're talking about burn scars. And what you're seeing here are three, three large burn scars in southern Wyoming and northern Colorado, where by my cursor, you're seeing the Mullen Fire burn scar, which kind of straddles the Colorado-Wyoming border. You're also seeing the Cameron Peak wildfire that occurred last year in Larimer, western Larimer County in Colorado, and then also the East Troublesome Fire just to the southwest of the Cameron Peak wildfire that spread so rapidly that it traversed over the Continental Divide and almost impacted the city of Estes Park. But the point is with uh, this imagery here that you can observe these burn scars which users can then use for future hydrological applications such as flash flooding. Because if you have any rapid convection or, or storms that develop rapidly over these burn scars, um, it could produce high rain rates which then since the, since the ground soil over these burn scars are pretty charred, it, it's going to be quite hard for that water to infiltrate into the ground soil and it usually will just run off. So leading to a higher probability of flooding in those particular areas. And in addition to that, I also wanted to highlight the satellite derived sounding capabilities from JPSS as well from the NOAA Unique Combined Atmospheric Processing System or NUCAPS, uh, which you can utilize these satellite derived soundings um, in cloud-free environments, but then also in data-sparse regions as well, especially in the western CONUS. Um, in this particular case, you're getting an example of a, a satellite sounding point near the Dixie Fire here, which is producing a lot of pyrocumulus um, here. And you can get an idea of the atmospheric, the atmospheric temperature in red and also moisture profiles in green. And you can see how, uh, how far apart those, um, the, the moisture and temperature profiles are apart, where you can see it's a really dry boundary layer and a really dry aloft and really steep lapse rates, which can be also additional, uh, can be conducive as well to additional fire spread and or uh, future um, or also uh, fire initiation in these areas. And um, I want to highlight one more example of just how JPSS and GOES will complement one another. Here's just an example of the 243 command fire in central Washington state. And um, so what you're seeing within the white ellipse of each image, the top image is the GO-17 ABI. In the bottom Im image is the SMPP VIRS. Excuse me. And, oops, excuse me again. What you're also seeing is that 
um, within the white ellipse, there is a fire in there. However, with the GOES data sets, although it has a high temporal resolution, the spatial resolution is not as uh, fine as the VIRS data sets. So, it's, so point being, it's a little bit challenging to see where the fire is in this particular case, although the GOES data sets have a higher temporal resolution. Now, in contrast, the SMPP polar orbiting data sets have a high, temp high spatial resolution as fine as 375 meters, which you get a better idea of the fire perimeter. And then also you get the cold uh, brightness temperatures from the nearby river just to the west, which the GOES does not capture as well. But then one of the limitations of polar orbiters to uh, be cognizant of is that the data set is not as timely as GOES. So you're going to get at least two overpasses per day per polar orbiting satellite. Uh, and how that compares to the, uh, the finer temporal resolution of GOES, where you're going to get data sets either ten, every 10 minutes, every 5 minutes, or every 1 minute. So, but this is just another case example of how you can utilize both to accomplish, in this case, uh, it, to assist you in fire monitoring. And also, uh, the last bullet there, highlighting additional characteristics to think about when you're utilizing both GOES and VIRS data sets. You have your data latencies, where, you know, it's the time of the satellite overpass to when that data set is ingested into like say AWIPS or the, uh, the forecasting and analysis software package for NWS forecasters, uh, for example. And then also um, your, the other thing to think about too when you're comparing data sets is the saturation temperature as well. And um, uh, so some additional things, you know, just want to re-highlight um, is just the operational coverage uh, of JPSS that's very beneficial uh, to you know, the Arctic the Antarctic uh, over the oceans where data is sparse and the benefits of having imagery in those areas and then also how we will continue to optimize our LEO capabilities not only with the NOAA satellites that we have but then also leveraging, leveraging the uh, international satellites that we have and, we, and also as we look forward to the JPSS2 satellites um, that uh, is tentatively scheduled for launch um, fall of next year. And we'll continue to work directly with our users in developing new products and, and, and optimize um, older products to help meet their needs. And with that, uh, I do have two or three more slides left, but I also wanted to highlight. Um, so throughout the previous slides, I've been highlighting a lot of JPSS applications and, and imagery interpretation and the benefits of JPSS, especially with forecasting models. And what I also wanted to highlight to users as well is how they can uh, go access the near real-time imagery because there's a lot of public websites out there that, have, that you as a user can go access. And these are, this is just a short list here on the left where you, can, you as a user can go access near real-time imagery from JPSS. And those are from the NOAA NESIS web pages. Um, my own cooperative institute at CIRA has what we call Polar Slider. You can go check out the link there. Also, we have other cooperative institutes as well, such as SIMS, NASA Sport, and also GINA that have uh, some additional websites that you can access near real-time imagery. Now, for GINA, for example, that their, their imagery is uh, Alaska-centric as well, and you can go check out some of their imagery that they have from the direct, direct broadcast antennas. In addition to that, I also have a, a web page I created um, titled JPSS Imagery for Users, and that it has a pretty comprehensive list of links for users to go check out and to access near real-time imagery and access more information about JPSS. And in addition to this, we also have the NASA Sport um, information as well, and uh, they not only have the imagery, near real-time imagery, but also I wanted to highlight their gridded new caps capabilities that they have, and you can go check out the link there. I mentioned those satellite-derived soundings earlier in an, in an animation or two. And what they also have is those atmospheric temperature and moisture profiles in a plan view and cross-section views as well, in addition to the standard sounding or skew T. In addition to this, I also wanted to highlight to users uh, not, only the, uh, not only highlight the accessibility to near real-time imagery, but if you had interest in how you can interpret that imagery um, or learn more about the individual spectral channels, products, RGBs, uh, we have a lot of training resources. And um, this is G JPSS specific, but we also have a lot for GOES as well, just so that you know. 
And what the first, the second bullet I'll highlight there is the JPSS Quick Guides, which are, which are essentially one to two page product reference documents for users. And here's an example of the Veer Snowmelt RGB, for example, that highlights uh, the following things. It highlights what is this RGB product or spectral channel? Um, why is the uh, product RGB or individual channel important? Why should I use it? What is the RGB recipe or what is the algorithm makeup of the product? What is the spatial, temporal, or spectral resolutions and or data latencies I need to think about about this product? In addition, it also highlights the primary applications uh, for um, the data set along with the limitations you have to also consider. In addition to that, it also helps users understand and uh, help interpret the imagery, no matter if it's an RGB, spectral channel, or product. And then it gives a, an example or two how it compares to other imagery, uh, other products as well, and then um, with additional resources. Um, so th those could be very helpful for you. In addition to that, we have what we call these JPSS quick briefs, which kind of go a little bit more in depth in the product application videos as well. And you can go click out, uh, click the link there. And then the other two things I also wanted to highlight are our satellite foundational course for JPSS, or SAT FCJ, which if you're uh, new to satellites and want to learn more about JPSS, you can go ch uh, go take that training. And uh, there's, um, I think, 13 modules there where you can go check out and learn more about the polar orbiting satellites. Now, in addition to that, we also have what we call these satellite blogs uh, from the JPSS and also from the GOES perspective as well, in which then, uh, if you click on that link, it'll, it'll direct you to some other satellite blogs. Excuse me. And uh, uh, they'll highlight, these blogs will highlight the near real-time uh, events that occur and all and how users can employ JPSS imagery and data sets and also uh, the ghost data sets. And with that, this is my last slide, but I just had a few things to highlight before I come to a close and we open up for Q&A. The first thing I wanted to highlight here on the top left, um, what I haven't mentioned yet is how can a user go access and download the data sets? Um, here's just one uh, one way of doing that. So this is uh, from NOAA class. You can go click on that link, the class link there, and you can go, uh, it's a free registration, you can go um, uh, set up your user accounts and download the data sets there. And then also, not only if you had interest in downloading the data sets, but if you wanted to visualize your data, you can go to the Mikaitis V um, web link here that is produced from the University of Wisconsin and the SSEC where you can visualize the imagery for a particular case scenario that you're interested in. in. And then also, I wanted to highlight as well our NOAA direct broadcast sites um, to help our users especially get the lowest lat latency uh, needed um, for our users to help in the forecasting missions. And uh, we have a lot of DB sites uh, over North America extending all the way into Alaska and then also over the Pacific Ocean as well. And with that, um, as me, as a JPSS satellite liaison, I continue to uh, work in between the user communities, such as yourself, and then also the research community in enhancing and promoting the JPSS products, applications, and also the development of satellite training resources for our users. And what I'll, I'll also say is please, if you have any questions, um, I'll do my best to try to answer those questions. And you can contact me. Uh, please don't hes hesitate to email me. My contact info is right there at the bottom there. And, um, and then also I want to say I appreciate you uh, for attending this webinar. And I thank you for your time. And are there any questions? That was great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Thank you. So much, thank you. That was a great presentation. Great. So we, yeah, we will have our live Q and A se uh, s session now, and uh, as I've mentioned before, questions can be asked to the presenter by using the chat window uh, there at the bottom, where you can enter questions. And um, while you were talking, Jarrell, we did get the question of: uh, Is this data available to the public? Um, I believe all those links you showed are all publicly available. Is that right? That is that is correct. Yeah, all of the links I sh I have provided uh, should be publicly available. That is correct.
question that came in is, is there uh, data that you would like to get from satellites but currently don't? I currently don't. Um, as of right now, uh, from my perspective, um, and maybe, well, I'm trying to think. Hmm. I don't know. I, I'll, I'll say at the moment, um, I think I, I I think what we have is really good. But I always um, I'll, I'll take a tangent to that question. But like, I think uh, I, I'm excited. Let's just say I'm excited for more data sets uh, from JPSS two to provide even more imagery uh, access for our users. But then also um, that information being in, ingested and integrated into the forecasting models. We got another question from our audience. Uh, uh, he says, I, I may have missed this, but what do you anticipate will be the most significant added value when JPSS 2, 3, 4, which are, which are the next satellites that will be launched, right? Uh, when they're launched and integrated into NWP models by the end of the decade? Um. Well, definitely more satellites, um, uh, you know, get into the constellation. And what's what's interesting is that, you know, with SMPP, you know, it's been up there for at least 10 years. And usually satellites have like a five to seven year lifespan. So uh, we're, we're trying to see, uh, hopefully SMPP, you know, stays up there as, as long as it can. And it'll be, it'll be interesting by the time JPSS2 comes aboard, if we, uh, you know, assuming that, you know, uh, assuming that SMPP is still uh, producing data data for our users to have the three at least three satellites, but then once we get into like JPSS three, and then JPSS four, it'll be interesting to see if we still um, you know have three cur uh, currently monitoring or if it's just two. You know, it just depends on the lifespan of each satellite. But I'm really excited to just um, the the additional new improvements. Uh, that may be developed by the time J3 and J4 come along, um, whether it be for the forecast model or and or just the imagery itself. Jarrell, if anybody has that question. Um, now, uh, a question that we got from, from David here, he's, he asks, do you know of a satellite-derived SWE product? A derived SWE, so uh, I assume in they're referring to the snow water equivalent. And um, if that is indeed the case, um, I, I know there's a few, uh, I believe few blended products, I believe. It's either blended or individual instrument products. Um, what I can do um, is connect with, with that user. Um, what was his name again? David. Uh, David. I can connect with David. Um, and he can connect with me and I can, um, uh, direct him to the appropriate, uh, data sets. But th there are a few. Um, I'm, I believe there's one from, if I remember correctly, there should be one from ATMS and then I think one from AMSR SWE as well. Uh, which which that instrument comes from the uh, the GCOM satellite or a part of the G the JAXA space program, but I know there's been some training that has been developed for SWE that I know for sure. So, but I'll follow up with that user and connect them to the appropriate material. So, um, you know, David only provided his first name. David, you, if you want to reach out directly to Jorel, his email is on screen right now. Don't hesitate to do that. Uh, or if you want to use the Q&A window to send us your contact information, if you want us to reach out to you, we can do that as well. Uh, but as I mentioned, please do not hesitate to use uh, Jorel's contact info to reach out to him. Another question that we got here is, and, and this is an interesting question, Jorel, what is the most unusual use of JPSS data that you have seen? Unusual? Interesting. Unusual. Um, I would say, I think it's uh, just from my perspective, uh, and it's also from, <clears throat> I, th I think it more... Uh, was more enlightenment for me early on in my career, um, like a few years ago, when I was seeing not only from the JPSS perspective, but also from the GOES perspective. 
Uh, the point here is how you can observe fires at night. And what I didn't realize um, was, I think it was about three or four years ago when I was noticing how users would utilize the microphysical products to observe fires. Uh, so like for example, from the GOES or JPSS where you're utilizing the night fog product, for example. Some users may be aware of this on here, but some people may not be. But it utilizes um, you know, a brightness temperature difference between the 10.3 and then the 3.9. And what's key is the 3.9 micron channel, which is sensitive to fire hotspots. And I didn't know at first that, that users can also employ those kind of data sets, which are technically, um, the, the primary application is to help discriminate between, or differentiate between the microphysical characteristics of clouds, such as ice and water, or ice and liquid water clouds. Uh, but what they also can do is utilize it for fires as well, since it employs the 3.9, and especially a very intense fire. And I, I thought that was, I wouldn't say unusual, just different, just unique. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. And David did respond, say that he would reach out to you, Jarrell. So I expect a, an email from David. Um, we got another question here, uh, it, um, and it's, uh, it mentions, it is so cool that SMPP was actually a tech demo, and yet it is flying longer than all the other polar satellites. Do you have any comments on that, Jarrell? Yeah, it's, um, I'm just, uh, from my perspective, I'm just kind of just riding out the wave, so to speak, like just stay up there as long as you can, SMPP, <laughs> you know, because it would be nice. I, I know there's a lot of uh, um, talk right now just trying to figure out, you know, if, if SMPP is still operating by the time JPSS2 is uh, launched and in orbits, you know, you know, technically we'll have three satellites, you know, and more data sets. And it'd be interesting how to, to work that. But um, uh, I'm just trying to, all I'm doing is just uh, hoping that SMPP can stay out there as long as it can, you know, before it's a uh, uh, end of time, I guess. Yeah, and and this satellite, the Swami MPP satellite, is it uh, as integrated into operations as JPSS one? Like, is all that data going into the models and everything just like JPSS one? Yeah, to my understanding, I believe that is the case, uh, not only for the forecasting model, but also like the imagery perspective. So for example, um, a few of those animations I was highlighting are directly from AWIPS, which is that satellite, which is that um, forecasting and analysis software package that National Weather Service forecasters employ uh, on their day-to-day -day operations. So you're, uh, so users are bulking SMPP and NOAA 20 datasets currently. And that's not only for CONUS uh, or the uh, continental US users, but then also for our uh, OCONUS users, such as Alaska and uh, Hawaii. Great, thank you. Yeah, these, these satellites are really well engineered, right? And they and they last not just their lifetime, but, but even longer. And the same can be said about the previous generation of polar satellites, right? The POSE satellites, uh, some of those are, are still flying around and still delivering data to the, to the models, right? I believe so. Um, Another question from Mort. Uh, Mort was the person who had the question before. Uh, he wonders, do JPSS have aerosol detection instruments? Um, let's see here. Aerosol detection. I'm trying to think. I know we have, let's see, I'll say this. We do have aerosol products from Veers that we do have. And I can also connect with that user. Uh, uh, connect him with the near real-time imagery data sets and then also just the products itself. And in addition to that, we also have the OMPS instruments, which deals with a lot of ozone. So maybe not particularly aerosol, but also ozone. Um, and But I'm not as familiar with instrument besides the ozone capabilities. But with respect to aerosols, uh, the VIRS instrument does produce some aerosol data sets. Yes. Very good, thank you. Um, a question in here, and, and, and um, I'm, I'm actually curious to hear this too. How will JPSS2 improve the polar data we currently get? Um, it, it, well, of course, additional imagery um, that the users can access. Um, it will be interesting um, how JPSS2 will be uh, configured um, as of right now, you know, you have SMPP and Node 20, 
one of the earlier animations I I showed was um, a conus view where you can see both SMPP and NOAA 20 SWATs. Now they're separated by 50 minutes. They're 50 minutes apart. And what will be interesting, at least to me, is from the JPSS2 point of view, um, how that will be configured to that 50 minute interval or will it be in between that 50 minute interval? Uh, that is unclear to me um, at the moment how that will be designed or if that has been determined already. Uh, but that will be interesting and then of course just the high impact of um, that new additional imagery and data sets into the forecasting model to help uh, improve the forecasting global model data sets. Very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I had another question here. Uh, so this is, the, and you know, this serves a little bit as a segue to what I'm going to be talking about here in a second, which is, which are our upcoming net talks over the next couple of weeks. But the question is, how can data from JPSS be combined with geostationary satellite data? All right. Well, like, um, excuse me, I did highlight a few examples um, throughout this presentation, but um, I think the, the, the keys are highlighting both the benefits of both satellites in regards to, let, let's say, for example, a user wants to utilize both satellites for fire, fire monitoring, for example. And with JPSS data sets, although they're not as timely, you know, it has a coarser temporal resolution, you can utilize the high spatial resolution of those data sets when they do come in. Um, to the appropriate time, and uh, you can observe the intricate details of the fire perimeters, for example, and fire aerial extent, uh, compared to, say, the GOES data sets, which have a little bit coarser of the spatial resolution. And of course, this also depends on the particular product or RGB or spectral channel that we're talking about. But you can, a point being with the JPSS data sets, in regards to fire monitoring, you can utilize the high spatial resolution details to extract the um, uh, the fire uh, fire perimeter, for example, and then in concert with that, you can utilize the ghost data sets for that high temporal refresh rate to see any uh, uh, different changes or evolution in those changes on a, a ten minute, five minute, or one minute time scales. And that's just that's just one way of utilizing it. But what we're trying to do um, is, you know, we have JPSS, we have ghost, but we also want them integrate together for users so that they can utilize them appropriately for a particular um, uh, mission of interest. Right. Kind of like combining that high temporal resolution from geostationary whenever possible with a high spatial from JPSS, right? And the, the best of both world, worlds. Yes. Yes. Um, there's a question here, which which might be a bit technical, uh, but let's let's see if we can cover it. It's um, it's from Selena. She asks, "Do you have a sense of how often the new caps? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Okay. N U C A P S products are used by the operational WFOs. Those are the weather forecast offices. And she mentions, I attended a satellite book club seminar, and that yeah. particular weather forecast office did not seem to know the new caps products were available on AWIPS. Yeah, so uh, first of all, you said satellite book club seminar series. I, I, I attend those seminars all the time. <laughs> and it's always interesting because uh, with those seminars, uh, people are not aware. They're mostly led by National Weather Service users and how they incorporate both uh, satellite applications, whether it be from the GOES or JPSS perspective. But in regards to new caps, uh, so yes, they are in AWIPS. Um, and uh, I guess it depends on the user, but um, you know, it's, and that's where I kind of come in as, as my role of a liaison to remind users uh, that these products are in their AWIPS system. Uh, so with new caps, um, they're Across the across the U.S., um, when we have our satellite focal points, there are some forecasters out there that are just like really satellite savvy, and that uh, like any kind of new satellite product they'll utilize, and we kind of gravitate towards those users, and then they will um, spread their knowledge to other users as well, in regards to new products such as like say or or, or older products such as like say new caps, and um, uh, pretty much highlighting the utility of those products. Now with new caps, uh, I believe to the question, uh, it is available in AWIPS. 
uh, for our users and users are employing it. I've seen it for like say fire weather as I showed a fire weather example. I've also seen it uh, utilized for uh, convective weather, so severe weather, trying to get an idea of the atmospheric temperature and moisture profile right before convective initiation starts for like a severe weather event um, over like an enhanced, enhanced risk region uh, denoted by the SBC or Storm Prediction Center. Um, I've seen it over that. I, I've also seen it utilized also for hurricanes as well, uh, like uh, just in data sparse regions or uh, over the oceans where, um, where the hurricane is forecasted to go through, what is the atmospheric environment, how dry is it, how, how, how much moisture is in there. Um, and then I've also seen um, newer research on um, utilizing those satellite soundings or new caps with respect to uh, the cell or the Saharan uh, air layer, the, pretty much observing the dust that is infected off the, off the western coast of Africa, in which that dust travels thousands of or hundreds to thousands of miles west, and it can reach uh, Puerto Rico and the Caribbean islands, but then also can uh, impact the lower 48 at times. So I, I hope I addressed the cool. question there. Yes. Yeah, I think you did. That, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, we don't seem to have any other questions rolling in, which is good news because we are at the end of the hour. I did want to mention to everybody that, you know, uh, at least on my screen right below this, there's a presentation download window where you can download the presentation in case you want to have that contact info or any of those links that Jarrell shared. They're all available there. Um, I also wanted to... Uh, 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 mentioned that on the bottom right, uh, bottom left corner, excuse me, there we've also added a link to the future Ned Talks, to the upcoming Ned Talks. But right now, I just wanted to thank Jorel for um, doing this wonderful presentation and answering all these questions. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you, Rafa, and thanks everyone for attending. I appreciate them all uh, uh, calling in. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. And again, folks, there's more Ned Talks during this month. We will continue to celebrate the two launches that NOAA is having next year. Two launches, two satellites, one mission. So uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in a week at our next Ned Talk.